Well, let's work on increasing our skills in textual criticism and establishing the text. This is lecture six. Practice establishing the text. So we're going to work on one very insignificant variation unit and then one that's more important. So here we have, and I would encourage you to look up in a fairly literal translation, Luke 23, 11. So turn it off and go find your verse, first of all. Luke 23, 11. So what we have here is a quite insignificant variation unit. And I would note to you that most variation units are insignificant like this. Scholars want to establish the text, and there are reasons even for people who are just learning to be able to at least understand how this is done and perhaps do a little bit of it themselves. So we're going to practice with this one, Luke 23, 11. So what we have here <clears throat> is um, the word chi. So your verse probably starts either with and or then, although there are a couple of other options. This chi um, is the word and. And so your verse probably either says Herod together with his soldiers went, you know, did these things to Jesus, or then Herod with his soldiers did these things. So it's not going to matter much for our understanding of the event, but it is a variation unit. So Kai has brackets around it here in the text, and notice it's called a C down here. This means the editors are also not so sure whether it should be uh, Kai or not. So the question is whether the word Kai is there. You'll notice Kai Ho Herodes and Herod. This is the article, and um, a lot of uh, languages put the article in front of personal names. English doesn't do that. So there's Kai Ho Herodes, or just hi, ho, ho Herodes. In other words, and Herod, or just Herod. Now what isn't clear in this section is that the word but is in the text. So it could say if the chi isn't there but Herod. If the chi is there, then it's something like the chi takes on a different meaning than but also Herod or but even Herod. And you'll notice I've offered these options here. Chi means and. So if it's if the chi is there, then you have to take seriously both the chi and the but, the de. So it could just ignore the de and say and Herod. But if you're taking the de seriously, then it would be but also Herod or but even Herod. If the chi is missing, then it just says ho Herodes. Uh, the word the is there, but we don't translate it. So then it would be either but Herod, because the de is always there, right? But Herod, then Herod, or even and Herod, because de can be translated in these various ways. So that's about the translation of these words that are highlighted in yellow. But then what we want to look at, of course, are the manuscripts which have the two readings. So Kai is in P75, which is the oldest manuscript, extant manuscript, that has this passage. And it has Kai. And so does Sinaiticus. That's the Hebrew letter Aleph. And so do some others that are decent manuscripts, both majuscules and minuscules. Without the chi, just ho Herodes is Alexandrinus, but also Vaticanus. This is why the C, because two of the best manuscripts have the chi, and one of the best manuscripts does not have it. In addition, Vaticanus is a good Alexandrian manuscript, but Bizai represents the Western text, and theta represents, and family one, represent the Caesarean text, as do several others that are listed here among the minuscules, and then the Byzantine text. So three different textual traditions do not have the chi for and, but the oldest manuscript, plus another good one, have it. So this is a problem. That's why they have a C there. 
Um, and now, if I was asking you to write a paper on this, I would ask you to make a choice. You can argue for Kai or you can argue against Kai, and I would just want to see that you give me good reasons. But notice also that this is not a very important variation unit. All right, so now we want to move on to the last piece of information on how to establish the text. Oh, sorry, I did want to show you that uh, some translations have decided to put the chi in, so they read and Herod. That's in the RSV, the King James, and the NASB. Then Herod is in the New King James and the NIV, and you might want to look and see what your translation has, because I haven't listed nearly all of them. Uh, then Herod could actually be with the chi or without. It's not clear what those translations are deciding to do. It is interesting that the King James changed the wording when it was uh, revised. All right, now we move on to the further information about establishing the text. Here's where you need to pay good attention because these are pieces of information and requirements to think logically about things that will uh, matter a lot if you try to master this skill. There are two main questions of probability. One is external evidence, the other is internal evidence. External evidence is also sometimes called manuscript probability. External means we're looking at the external objects, the manuscripts themselves, the witnesses to the text, and looking at what they read, what variant they have in any variation unit. And the question we'd be asking under external evidence would be, which variant is best supported by the manuscript evidence. When we do internal evidence, that's also called transcriptional probability. Transcriptional simply has to do with writing. So in the writing of the document, what is most likely to have happened? Two things are important here. One is, what would the author more likely have written? We'll be looking at a letter of Paul, so we'd be asking, which of these two words is Paul most likely to have written? Now this can be tricky because it could be that a scribe was so used to the way Paul normally writes things that the scribe may have changed it to something more Pauline when Paul didn't write very Pauline in that moment. So you can see that this one is, is a, uh, quite subjective and uh, has some booby traps. The other question is a little easier in most cases. What would a scribe more likely have changed? What is there about this variation unit that could have caused a scribe to make a change? You'll remember back when we were looking in 1 Timothy, we talked about the difference between hos and theos, that simply the fiber lines in a papyrus document could have caused a scribe to think of theos when the original actually was Hoss, and to think, wow, that makes sense, and it actually makes it more clear, so let's change it to Theos. Right? So that would be an example of a transcriptional probability concerning the scribe. So let's start with in external evidence, and I'll give you two rules. There are others, but these are the two probably most helpful for you at this stage. When you're looking at the manuscripts, so this is external evidence, you'd be asking which reading is in the best manuscript. So what we just looked at just now, I pointed out that there are good manuscripts in both groupings. The oldest manuscript had Kai. One of the other best manuscripts did not have it. Similarly, we looked at this with that reading which reading is found in more than one tradition. And we noticed that even though there was some variation in tradition for the reading Kai, the, the uh, omission of Kai actually was more clearly in all four textual traditions. So that made this a very hard choice, that previous one. All right, so we move now to uh, some of the 
rules for internal evidence, often you're looking for the shorter reading. Remember we said that the scribes in the Byzantine Empire, in their monasteries, wanted to gather the fullest form of the text. They're less likely to leave something out than to add something. So the shorter reading is more likely to be the Ausgangs text. But it's not always the case, and you will, if you continue to study this, you will find places where the shorter reading is not likely to be the first or oldest reading. Also, the more difficult reading. So if a scribe runs up against something that's hard to understand, the scribe is more likely to change it. So if you have two readings, one is very difficult, or the grammar is bad, or the structure of the sentence isn't very pleasing, and the other one has been fixed, then it's very likely that the more difficult reading was the Ausgangs text and that a scribe has tried to help out the reader by making some adjustments. This rule is the most important one. The reading that explains all the other readings is most likely to be the oldest form of the text or the Ausgangs text. In other words, if uh, one reading, because it was more difficult or for some other reason, makes, makes it, it, get, it causes the other readings to make sense as adjustments, then it's most likely to be the Ausgangs text or the oldest form of the text. Now we're going to practice with an, a variation unit that's actually very important. It changes the meaning of the sentence that it's in. I'd like you to turn the video off and get have a look at 1 Corinthians 2.1 and then come back and we will talk about it. So do that now. All right, so when you're reading 1 Corinthians 2.1, you should be noticing uh, either the word testimony or the word mystery. You may also find, and we'll point some of these out, there's other, a few other possibilities of how to translate the Greek so that there could be a different word there. Now, just to help you figure out which word we're talking about, it's a long verse. Let me, I'm reading from the New American Standard. Paul says, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. So your the translation may be slightly different in another in another Bible, but it, either it will say the testimony of God or the mystery of God. And you should have a footnote there. If you have a good Bible, it will have a footnote at this place because this affects translation. This is a real difference in meaning. Mystery versus testimony. So the first thing we'll do is look at the Greek behind the English, which is the external evidence, and we're going to work on establishing the text. The two possible Greek words that are in the various manuscripts are mysterion, which is the word mystery, and you'll see that that's the one that the UBS Bible has put in the text, and then they have a testimony about it here, they call this a B, um, and then the other one is marturion, uh, which is the word testimony. So there are more wit uh, witnesses here, but the ones I wanted to pull out, the, the sort of manuscripts that you want to look at more closely, are, for example, the word mystery, mysterion, is in P46. That's the oldest copy of this portion of text. Now the vid after that is important. It means it appears. It's from the Greek word video, uh, and it means that th the people who are reading the ancient manuscript P46 are not completely sure because there is something going on in the physical manuscript there. Maybe there's a a hole, maybe a margin has been cut off, uh, but, but by spacing out the number of words or by looking at beginning and ending letters of the word, they're pretty sure that P46, the oldest manuscript, reads mysterion. 
It's also in Sinaiticus. Now, what does this asterisk mean? Hang on to that question until we've looked at the whole thing on this page. Also in Alexandrinus and Ephraim Rescriptus, which are decent manuscripts, but not the best ones always. And in Codex 88, which is a good minuscule, and so on. So there are many other manuscripts that could be considered here. Marturion, on the other hand, which means testimony, is in Sinaiticus with a, with a superscript 2. What does that mean? We'll come back to that. Also in Vaticanus, which is very significant. In Bizi, the leading uh, member of the Western text. And in 1739, which is a minuscule you should learn because this is one of the best minuscules in the... Pauline letters and some other uh, sections of the New Testament. 1739 does not have Gospels, but it does have the Paulines. And, and it tends to be Alexandrian. And the Byzantine text. And the Church Father Origen, who is quite trustworthy, who you know tries pretty hard to get the word his, his words right. So we have, again, similar to previously, uh, one or two good Alexandrians and a few others that are decent versus one of the best Alexandrians, the best of the Western texts, a good Alexandrian, the entire Byzantine text, a good church father. So that's the, that's the two um, variants in this variation unit. Now let's look a little bit more at what's going on with Sinaiticus. Here's the situation. I've made a picture so you can see the actual situation. The word in the text of Sinaiticus is musterion, right? So that's what's written by the first hand, it's called, by the person who originally wrote the manuscript. That's what's meant by Aleph with an asterisk. The asterisk means the first hand. So the person who originally wrote the manuscript has Musterion. And if you remember, that's what we saw here. Musterion is in the, one, the Sinaiticus with an asterisk. So what's the two mean? Let's go back. There, written above, notice that you can just replace three letters and have the other word. Alpha above the Upsilon, Rho above the Sigma, and Upsilon above the Eta, changes this to marturion. So a corrector has come later and changed the reading by putting these three letters above the original letters. And the people who study Sinaiticus can recognize the hands of various of the correctors of this manuscript and they call this corrector corrector number two. So corrector number two is given the credit for making this change. And they have, if you read books about Sinaiticus, you can learn a little bit about that corrector and approximate date and what sorts of changes that person has been making in the manuscript. So that's what those two things mean with the asterisks and the superscript too. So here's our rules. Which reading is in the best manuscripts and which reading is found in more than one tradition? And there you notice, just like in the other one we looked at uh, a few minutes ago, we're finding the external evidence <coughs> to be pretty equally split. So if you were trying to decide and establish the text or maybe write a paper on this, you would be having to admit that in, this, in the external evidence about this manuscript, the evidence is split. All right. Let's see what we can say about the internal evidence then. Well, the rule about the shorter reading doesn't matter because the two words are equal in length. The word about the more difficult reading, or the rule about the more difficult reading, doesn't really help us either because both of them make sense. Is Paul proclaiming the testimony of God or is he proclaiming the mystery of God? Those are both very Pauline things to say. Then we come to the reading that explains the existence of the other readings. 
Now, we may not be able to make a, a really strong decision here, but we can make a decision and argue for it because this section allows for some speculation and argumentation. So again, I would like you to turn the video off. You leave this slide visible and study the text for yourself. Ask how this change might have occurred. And here it's important actually to talk about Paul. Uh, what is he most likely to have written? Uh, read the entire context, maybe starting back in uh, chapter 1 and reading up through the maybe the middle of chapter 2 or even the end of it. Read the whole thing and look especially at verses 1, 6 and 2, 7 and ask yourself from the context, what is Paul more likely to have written? And from the context, what changes might a scribe have been likely to make? Jot down some ideas and then start the video up again and I will meet you here. Okay, this is what you should have noticed in your study of this longer passage as it affects this variation unit. First of all, you should already be thinking from our look at the external evidence that these two words look a lot alike. Only three letters had to be changed and possibly uh, a word that was smeared or something could have been misunderstood. You also discovered by looking at those two verses that both ideas are found in the immediate context of this verse. In 1.6 and 2.7, there are no variations. Those two words are solid. 1.6, just to, uh, to help us remember, talks about the testimony about Christ, that it was confirmed in the Corinthians. And 2.7, just a few Verses later, that's where Paul says, we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. By the way, when Paul says mystery, almost always he means the fact that God intended to save the Gentiles from before the beginning of time. That's what the mystery is for Paul. It has been hidden since the ages, but now in Jesus it has been revealed. So that's what mystery means. Testimony is, is more clear. It's simply a word about uh, a witness of. Now, uh, the earlier, I should have put the UBS GNT, the UBS 3, uh, called this variation unit a C because they themselves were not very sure of what the Ausgangstext is. Now in the more recent UBSs, uh, four and five, they've called it a B. They're getting more confident. Uh, and remember, what did they have? Let's go back, see if we can find it. There we go, they had Musterion. So they have mystery, not testimony. All right. So what we can do now is also get a look at their logic, at their thinking. Why did they choose Musterion in the editorial committee? And there is something called, uh, we always just call it, have a look in Metzger's commentary, but here's the full name of it, a textual commentary on the Greek New Testament compiled by Bruce Metzger, one of the members of the committee, uh, published by the United Bible Societies. And there is a first edition that's worth having because sometimes they change their mind between editions. In this case, the two editions have the same wording. The second edition was published in 1994 and it has a B grade. All right, so here it is. So they give the verse, chapter two, verse one, the reading that they've put in the text, which is Musterion, and their confidence level, which is a B, not an A, but it's, it is pretty strong, it's a B. Mesker says, from an exegetical point of view, the reading marturion, 
to Theu, so the testimony of God, though well supported, and he points out that it's supported by Vaticanus and by a, a wide tradition of manuscripts, um, including a lot of gobbledygook that you don't need to learn right now. He says, Marturion, though well supported, is inferior to Musterion. Musterion has a more limited but early support in P46, the first hand of Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, for Emi Rescriptus, and so on. Again, a whole list of other witnesses, including languages and church fathers. He says, he gives his explanation here in the last sentence. He thinks that Marturion is recalling 1-6, which you looked at, right? So that a scribe uh, would be thinking about what was written in 1-6, sees that Mu, the first letter, and thinks Marturion, because the words look a lot alike, and recalls that, that it's about testimony back in 1-6 and writes testimony again. But what Metzger thinks is actually happening is that Musterion, in Paul's own thinking, prepares the reader for its usage in verse 7. That Paul is here in chapter 2, verse 1, beginning to talk about the mystery of God. All right. So we've seen that the exter the external evidence is split. The internal evidence is not easy. It could go either way, and you could argue for either word and develop a good argument for either word. Um, and uh, Metzger and the, U the UBS committee are convinced that Musterion is more likely the Ausgangstext. But let's look at what has happened in the translation of English Bibles. The, the whole English tradition is also split. There are Bibles that think that Musterion is the Ausgangstext. Those include the New Revised Standard, the New American Bible, and the New uh, King James. Sorry, I'm missing a K there. The New King James. The New Living Bible has not mystery, but God's secret plan, which is actually a pretty good translation because it's referring then to God's secret plan to save the Gentiles. The Message Bible, I think, is going with Musterion, but it's a little bit strange. God's sheer genius. Yeah. I like the Message Bible in some places, but here it's a little bit weird. All right. Musterion, uh, uh, Marturion, however, the word testimony, is in the Old King James, the NIV, and the TNIV. And I don't have a copy of the 2011 NIV, but I bet it probably also has testimony. The New American Standard Bible, which is a very good literal translation. There is also in the Revised English Version the word truth, which probably is coming from testimony and not from mystery. And the Old Living Bible has message, which again is almost certainly from testimony. Notice the New Living Translation switched to mystery. But those two don't have a lot of relationship between each other. All right, so this is a pattern you can follow the steps that I've taken in uh, doing your own work at establishing the text. You don't really have to know Greek. You can get a Greek scholar, a Greek student to help you figure out which uh, word in the apparatus is which or what their translation is. And as soon as you have that, the rest of the work can be done using the different tools, Metzger's commentary, English translations. You also could look in the footnotes of various commentaries that, that are good ones, which means they talk about variation units, and, and see what various people have decided, and then uh, decide for yourself which word you think is original. And this is a place where between various English Bibles, there is a difference in choice, and you do actually have to establish the text. If you're going to preach on this, or do a Bible study on it, or write a paper on it, you need to decide. 
All right, well, that is the last of our work on textual criticism, and we will be beginning a new lecture on choosing a good commentary uh, next of all.